Kyle. Okay. Yeah. Let's start. Yeah, it's deeply, it's deeply disturbing. Anyway, hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, welcome to the South Orange Library lecture series, special conversations. Um, this is a special Zoom only presentation so that we can have the honor of talking to Ron Watson, who is, we do have a few live guests in the meeting room, but awesome. Um, yeah, so I am so thrilled to have Ron here with us tonight. He is a dear old friend from William and Mary, College of William and Mary. Um, but he's also many other impressive things. He earned his doctorate in political science from the University of New Mexico in 2013. And he's now an associate professor of political science and health and society at Beloit College in Wisconsin. This is why we're Zooming because, you know, wouldn't ask Ron to fly across, although you could have gotten out of the snow. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm now, now I'm kind of upset that you didn't ask me. It was 70 degrees here today. Um, in addition to a lifelong interest in Japanese language, society, and culture, Ron's research interests include the politics of race and ethnicity, constitutional reform, domestic and global health inequalities, national health care systems, and public health policy. He's a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Beloit and serves as a commissioner on the Beloit Police and Fire Commission. And tonight he'll be speaking about one possible and controversial option for improving the state of our polarized nation, national separation or national divorce, whichever term you prefer. Please join me in welcoming Ron Watson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yes, um, Laura is my dear friend, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to be back here to speak with you all this evening. Um, and as we were sort of talking about a little bit before the recording began, it, I mean, I like to smile and laugh and all of those sorts of things. But you know, I find myself, especially the older I get, a lot of the topics that capture me are you know these doom and gloom um, scenarios. But I do also believe very much in, in seeing the other side of things. And sometimes um, it's important for us to have the political imagination to imagine doing things differently so that we don't go down the same paths as before, even if they aren't pleasant to think about. Um, and so if I can share my screen, uh, let's see if I can. While you're doing that, I just wanted to mention to everyone that, so um, he will talk for a while and then, um, we are going to have questions in the chat. So if you can, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat anytime, and then I'll be reading them um, for Ron later on. But please feel free to add them at any time. Okay. And so what I'd like to do is um, I'll go ahead and run through uh, my my sort of really my thoughts on on this idea of a national breakup. Um, and then when we get to the end, we can have some questions and, and sort of dive into it. Uh, this is, I think this might be fun. <laughs> okay, so let me go ahead and get going. So Brightline Watch, an organization dedicated to surveying and assessing the health and trends in American democracy today, uh, conducted a survey after the 2020 election that asked respondents in different regions of the country whether they would be willing to join new countries formed around regionally similar states. Um, well, as it turns out, nearly 30% of respondents at the time said yes. And here's the breakdown. So if you take a look, um, you, can, you can see the different regions here. Uh, the blue, these are your Democrats, red people who are Republican, and then 35 are independents. And so this is these are the percentages of the 30%, right? Of the 30% who said yes, um, you can see some really interesting numbers here. Um, that out here in the north, the sort of northeast, 39% uh, of Democrats, 35% of people who call themselves independents, right? So if you put those numbers together, right, this is pretty, you know, this is some pretty dramatic uh, support here um, all across the country. And so what I would say is given the persistence of ideas like the big lie, right, that the 2020 election was somehow stolen, and the continuing popularity of former President Trump despite his role in inciting an attempted insurrection and coup on January 6, 2021. Uh, this map 
is really serving as the backdrop for the rest of my discussion. And so I'm going to take a little bit of a breath here. And I'll stay, just keep this on the screen for now. Um, in an impassioned speech at the first Constitutional Convention in July 1787, Delegate Governor Morris offered his own take on how best to solve the impasse over human slavery among his fellow, fellow delegates. And here's what he said. Either this distinction, and that distinction being between Northern and Southern states, is fictitious or real. If fictitious, let it be dismissed and let us proceed with due confidence. If it be real, instead of attempting to blend incompatible things, let us at once take a friendly leave of each other. There can be no end of demands for security if every particular interest is to be entitled to it. And so I see that as a way to, to frame this conversation. The stark divide evident since the 2020 election represents polarized stances on any number of important social issues and problems with the extent and character of the polarization suggesting, at least to my mind, little possibility for reasonable compromise in order to move forward. And I would argue that this is true even with issues for which compromise is theoretically possible, such as climate change. So one can easily imagine an urgent but measured response despite the growing seriousness of the problem. And here, um, let's think, for example, of carbon neutrality, say, among the most impactful industries within five years. But how does one compromise when a significant proportion of roughly half of the electorate and key political leaders either refuse to acknowledge the existence or the urgency of climate change at all, or believe it is nothing more than a vast sinister plot by climate scientists of all people uh, with some hidden but nefarious agenda. Addressing gun violence is another area where compromise should be possible but mysteriously is not. In reality, there is an array of options between a complete ban on all guns and a free-for-all approach to private gun possession and ownership. And just as an example, just to give a couple of examples here, we could see, for example, the reintroduction of bans on assault and semi-automatic rifles um, or mandatory waiting periods of varying lengths and extensive background checks. In practice though, even modest attempts to stem the tide of violence and of course tragedy of firearms in America are stymied by the outsized influence of the gun rights lobby and what I would term the fetishization of the second amendment. The result, well, political commitment to an antiquated amendment passed at a time when even the most skilled riflemen required nearly a minute to reload a single shot musket rifle or pistol. And this, mind you, despite hundreds of thousands, yes, and that is the right number, hundreds of thousands of deaths due to gun violence in the past decade alone. And of course, then there are the issues that involve the human rights of individuals and for which compromise is neither appropriate nor morally permissible. These include full recognition or recognition of the full rights and personhood of gay, lesbian, and transgender individuals, as well as the persistence of racial inequalities in metrics ranging from infant and maternal mortality to police violence, to also gender gaps in pay and promotion. The opposition position on these issues seeks either to ignore the existence or, or the severity of problems entirely, or to blame victims in some fashion for their own suffering. Um, and we've seen this any number of times with the why didn't they just comply, right? Um, instead, or I should say, instead of a push for gender-free bathrooms like that most of us have in our homes, we see laws that force transgender individuals to use bathrooms for the gender they were assigned at birth. To cries of Black Lives Matter, when yet another unarmed or non-threatening black person is summarily executed by police for either a minor infraction or nothing at all, rather than demands to end racism, 
and uphold the 14th Amendment, we get the passage as in Oklahoma of laws shielding drivers who hit or kill protesters from prosecution. With respect to abortion, instead of protection of a woman's right to make her own difficult reproductive choice in private, we get state laws like those of Texas and Louisiana that essentially ban abortion in all but name. And as we all now know, a push to appoint Supreme Court justices who openly misled the public and effectively repealed Roe v. Wade in what one can only assume is a bid to force the entire nation back to the horrors of unsafe abortions witnessed prior to 1973. Now, all of this, of course, while steadfastly opposing comprehensive sex education in schools, ignoring the racial and age bias in the adoption of unwanted children, overlooking the numerous problems of the US foster care system and the children in its care, and demanding more cuts to the country's already paltry social safety net. Mm. Now, here's one of the things I will say. Any and all of these concerns are in fact amenable to good and intentional social policy. But I am convinced that none of this is possible in a house as divided as modern America is today. And this is to say nothing of the need to, and this is sort of a, a nod to uh, another friend of mine, Everett Hill, um, who has been very inspiring to me with respect to uh, the importance of institutional design, the need to redesign our guiding document, the centuries old constitution, which is sorely lacking as a legal framework to cope with the realities of American life and governance in the 21st century, but also beyond that. So here's another way of understanding why, at least to me, a breakup of some kind may be necessary. Imagine, if you will, the formation of the United States as an operating system. I mean, I'm a computer guy, so this sort of makes sense to me. Maybe other people are like, oh, my God, I don't want to think about operating systems. Well, you know, you're stuck with that with me. Today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so let's call it American Democracy 1.0. This system was a radical innovation at the time, all right? And for those of you who remember, for example, like, you know, the original Windows or even DOS, right? It's like, oh my God, you know, how can it be better than this, right? <laughs> um, but, in, but imagine that, right? It's a radical innovation at the time. Um, and it was one that actually shook up the political and social world of the 18th century and changed life as they knew it. But it was not without its flaws some significant and profoundly costly even then. And despite substantial patches and updates since, the early bugs in that original operating system now leave it vulnerable to exploitation by what I would term malicious hackers and malware, mm -hmm. all while failing to adequately and effectively protect the lives and assets of many of its users over time. Now, let's just be real. This is to be expected because when American Democracy 1.0 was first launched, it was designed to be, and literally designed for, a very narrowly defined set of users, most of whom shared strikingly similar user profiles, right? I'm, I'm keeping the computer metaphor going as far as I can take it here, okay? Um, those folks tended to be almost entirely white, almost entirely male, almost entirely wealthy, uh, middle-aged, and any number of them also were slave owners. It also sought to address a set of problems that today are different in scope, scale, and content from what the original developers and users had in mind. And while updates over the years have, of course, sought to improve the user experience and broaden the user base, the system is simply not up to the task, I would argue, of tackling the challenges faced by many of today's users including the dominant role of the internet in American life. American Democracy 2.0, now I would say, will naturally take its inspiration from this pioneering system. And it was pioneering. It was extraordinary for its day. Um, and it will likely incorporate many aspects of the updates made to it over the years. But there are some users who will insist on retaining the old system. 
regardless of, or perhaps a bit more cynically because of the risks it now poses to the public. So in my mind, rather than force everyone to upgrade and then deal with the inevitable backlash when any misstep occurs or have to constantly counter attempts to break the new system by disgruntled users loyal to the old one, the best option by far may be to create a firewall between 1.0 purists and those upgrading to 2.0 and let each set of users utilize both systems as they see fit. In other words, what I'm arguing here is that Americans have once again become polarized around irreconcilable differences, nearly all of which a constitution created back in the late 1700s uh, is unable to properly reconcile. And while that phrase, irreconcilable differences, may be a bit of a cliche, I think we all know what it means. It's probably time to break up. <laughs> So given the disastrous results the last time the nation chose unreasonable compromise over good sense, finding the courage to go our separate ways, however discomforting, is the key to living our best lives as Americans, whatever we envision that to be. So as I thought through the Bright Line Watch map that I showed you earlier um, and what it could mean, a set of possible procedures for achieving this end relatively peacefully and painlessly. And again, I will emphasize the word relatively, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about that in a, uh, in a bit. Uh, but anyway, um, a set of procedures for doing this relatively peacefully and painfully, uh, painlessly emerged. And so ideally, we would start with some sort of national conference on American unity, right? Uh, states would send delegates to have have the conversation, right? Are we to remain as a nation, right? Um, one of the questions that was asked early on in the country's, um, are we to be a nation, right? Uh, asked early on in the country's history. Then based on the conclusion of that conference, states would uh, then hold plebiscites on regional breakup. Right, just along the lines of again following what what the bright line data showed us. Right, um, they'd hold plebiscites on regional breakup, independence, or no change. Right, uh, and for me, uh, so that we can avoid some of the some of the constitutional issues. Right, the issue of trying to you know, figure out well how do we you know how do we make this happen. For me, this is really about um, focusing on a particular interpretation of the Tenth Amendment. Right, which sort of leaves um, any rights not not specifically uh, uh, allocated to the states, uh, leaving those rights uh, to the states and or, or, or the states or to the people. And so, for me, that allows you to you know make the decision to leave, right? Even though it's not expressly um, enumerated in the Constitution as a right. Um, here, as we keep going. Uh, a simple majority would trigger the start of a two-year campaign um, ahead of final votes uh, at midterms or generals, right? So depending on how this is how this is timed, that's how I would see this, right? If the plebiscite goes a particular way and it says, okay, we want to do a regional breakup. All right. So now the country, that state has, or those states have two years uh, to really make their case to the folks, uh, to their, to the citizens of their state that this is something that makes sense, this is something we wanna do. Um, and then they will come back again for a final vote um, at the midterms or the general election, whichever is closest. And assuming that, that that vote went through, then we would see the creation, I think sensibly of something like a national relocation center or some sort of benefits that would need to be enacted. Um, I think it's absolutely unreasonable to expect to expect folks who don't want to stay in that state to stay there. And uh, even though I said that this transition would be relatively painless and relatively peaceful, um, at the end of the day, anyone who has gone through the pain of divorce knows sometimes you gotta pay. And this is how it goes, right? I mean, this is the, this is the cost. Um, and of course, money is something that can be replaced, but lives cannot. So yeah, at some point we're gonna to have to pay for people to move, um, give them the ability to move either into other states or to other countries, wherever they want to go. 
And then the way I see it, there'd be a final two year period where we would begin to see the negotiations between um, the states that are making the decision to leave and then the, whatever the federal government that remains. Um, and this would involve, of course, resource and resident relocation, um, state and federal government negotiations, um, maybe negotiations with respect to uh, federal property that is in those states that now want to leave. And then finally, we have a new national configuration, however that looks. Um, and folks can start moving on to, uh, to living their lives the way they want to. I'm gonna stop here. So once that process is complete, or once the separation process is complete, um, I would say that all involved can then go about living their best lives apart. Now, those formerly dissident states will now have a unique opportunity to enact their previously contentious policy preferences, this time with a largely willing constituency. So, you know, to me, that's like a bargain, right? Now, now we're, we're in a state where everybody wants to ban these things or wants not to ban these things. Um, ironically, and, and I've talked with some folks about this and, you know, not everyone agrees with me, but, but some people do. I suspect that even with respect to highly polarized policy areas like climate change, that states where there is significant opposition to those policies today, once this process is over, will likely see real progress made once their ideological enemy is no longer present to activate hostility, right? Because the last time I checked, Everybody actually wants clean air and, and water. <laughs> That's the last time I checked. Everyone needs food. Everyone, no one wants to live in a society where police violence is a norm or where violence of any kind is a norm, right? But perhaps more importantly, in whatever configuration that emerges, there are exciting possibilities in the states for the kinds of social and cultural transformations that become possible when entrenched political opposition to embracing concepts like diversity, anti-racism, and robust educational and healthcare reform is removed. So here's where I, I get a little idealistic. I say, well, you know, imagine living in a country where for the first time, the value of the lives and contributions of all citizens is appreciated society-wide and where equity, inclusion, and equality are not just aspirations, but are actively pursued norms. Now, I've said all of that, but I do think that we have to also consider some options that are short of a breakup, right? And we can, again, sw swing back around to this um, because I'm hoping that, that folks will talk about what might work and what might not work. And the tall and short of it is this, what we might call um, significant devolution of power to disaffected states. But here's a spoiler alert. This is kind of already happening. Um, it's just that there are a couple of tweaks around it um, that I would, would maybe uh, suggest. So in short, states would uh, be able to enact most policies freely, but they would have to give up some things in return. One of those would be they need to reduce their number of representatives in Congress and the roles of those representatives on committees, right? Which to me only makes sense. Uh, you can't both decide that, you know, I don't want the federal government telling me what to do and also decide you're going to tell everyone else what to do. No, thank you. Um, I would say here that, again, we need to move back to this would require us to move to a, a space where state Supreme Courts or state high courts would settle all in-state policy issues, period. Um, no sort of appealing to a higher court if you're in those states. Um, relocation assistance would be made available federally. Again, in any configuration that I think of that is one that I would consider to be ethical, um, you have to give people the ability to vote with their feet. And this is one where um, I think it's unreasonable to assume that, that, that folks should, uh, should themselves sort of take all of the, uh, the burden 
of both moving and or shutting down businesses or switching businesses and those sorts of things. Um, we do have the funds available to do that. We always do, um, as the as the uh, stimulus checks proved. The money is available. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that, you know, as I look sort of at a from a federal perspective, that we do also need in this context, if we're going to do this devolution thing right, we need to have a reset of the Supreme Court, of the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and that will include things like term limits, um, more justices, and maybe justices that are that are um, appointed quite deliberately um, to reflect the nation itself in important ways. But as I have talked to folks, I think that somewhat interestingly, um, if, if we look beyond my 10th Amendment justification for saying, hey, you know, any relationship can can end. Um, and that has to be an intrinsic right. Uh, conversely, one of the issues here is that that constitutional amendments or constitutional change might be needed, which would, in some respects, make this a much more difficult path to pursue, um, unless you could uh, line people up or line up the, uh, the various actors within this appropriately. So I'm gonna just say in conclusion, Few relationships of any kind last forever. And there are many that can and should end, especially when an impasse is reached that can only be bridged through the abuse or subjugation of one party by the other. And that is a thing I am not interested in. For better or for worse, America is at this crossroads today. Um, as I think January 6th uh, really rightly pointed out and everything that's happened since. Given the terrible and likely consequences, if the extreme polarization we see today continues, making the conscious choice to end things properly and walk away may ultimately determine where we find ourselves as a people tomorrow. So that's the backdrop to any of the rest of the conversations I'd like to have. So I'd like to stop there and maybe dive into, into what people think and, and other ideas that people have. Thank you, Ron. Of course. That was fascinating. And I just wanna remind people that um, if you do have a question, if you could put it in the chat, that would be great. And then I will read it out. Um, don't be shy, put it in the chat. Um, I had some questions. Ask, ask away. Uh, I was very impressed that you got the nerdy computer analogy in. <laughs> <laughs> it works really well. It, it does, it does. I mean, I, I, I have to admit, I think it does. It just sort of came to me. My friend Mark was like, man, this is, this is how this does make sense. Sorry, go ahead. It really does. It really was really nice. I really got it. And I'm not a computer person, um, but I, I enjoyed that. I guess one of my questions whenever I think about this is, I mean, you answered my question. I always think about like, oh gosh, so then people will have to move. You know, how will that, look but you kind of answered that with the um you know providing that of course it would be messy yes of course painful but you you know the government would provide benefits for relocation relocation resources things like that um i guess one of my questions is or worries is um you know so okay so we separate into regions mm -hmm. um but then how, you know, so let's say in the Northeast, mm -hmm. we're, of course, passing like very advanced climate change yeah. <clears throat> laws and in the Midwest, which we are right up against, no offense, some of the Midwest. That's <laughs> what it is, as, as, it, as it snows after having been like 60 degrees the other day, no. <laughs> um, or let's say, yeah, so up against another region that is not, you know, enforcing those policies or making those policy changes, yeah. you know, their decisions would still affect our region, of yeah. course. Yeah. Um, and same with like gun control, you know, how would we, or how do you think we would deal with the kind of slippage between regions? Yeah, I mean, I think that this actually is one of the most important issues, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna refer back to 
uh, the statement I made that I actually think that a good chunk of of the concerns would actually go away um, once you removed if you removed us right like let's say you know I'm in a state where um, I've got a bunch of folks who but maybe 30 percent are opposed to these policies all right or to whatever policies when we move right when I move I think that then those that those folks who remain that will see their policy preferences that they will they will normalize for the most part. So let's take the climate, right? right. Um, you know, climate change. You know, to me, so much of what we are experiencing today is is what I would call sort of you know the politicization of of what should not be politicized. Right. right? I mean, climate change is an undeniable reality that we're in, um, and. And even if, even if on some, in some way you're like, well, no, it's really not man-made. Okay, that's fine. But we're still in the midst of clear climate change mm -hmm. and we need to do something about it or it's going to destroy our ability to, to maintain crops and our economy. So no matter how you look at it, whether you think it's, you know, so the anthropogenic, right? It comes from us or you think it's natural. We still got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that, that in some, uh, for some issue areas, that you'll start to almost probably almost immediately see um, change. Or here's the thing, yeah. you know, treat it the way treat it the way that we treat our interactions with other countries. If three of the four blocks, uh, three of or three of the five blocks are like, hey, look, we got to do something about climate change. And the Midwest block, for example, is like, no, -uh. it's like, OK, cool. Then we're just not going to trade with you guys anymore. So good luck with that. Right. right? You know, we Sanctions, use the same. Kind of. yes. Yeah. You know, we use the same we use the same inducements that we use with nation states, right? Because if in effect we're dealing with a different nation state, right? And that's to me that's that's how you that's how you make this happen. You mentioned guns, and I think that that's that's sometimes a trickier one, right? Because what we've seen happen um, is guns produced in or guns bought and purchased and sold in in states like Indiana, for example, end up on the streets of Chicago, right? So in Illinois, right? Um, and I think that there's a there's a way in which the idea of having now the ability to say no, there's a border here, uh, provides us with with the means to the, the sort of legal means, right, to to do something about that in a way that we can't do right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I think again, but this is another area where I think sensible gun control is going to become would become a norm. Right. Even in those states, even states that today are like, no, no, no. You know, here, give the little baby a gun here. Take it. You know, <laughs> even in those states that people will start to. Sorry, I know it's in bad taste, but, you know, it's, I feel I feel a lot like that nowadays. Right. Yeah. Um, it's like that's the way to solve everything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but. But that I think that to a certain extent, you might even see what we might consider otherwise sensible or common sense gun control um, mm -hmm. emerge in those places as well. But even if it didn't those states that don't want the flow of guns, um, the sort of unfettered flow, they have, I think, greater tools. They have this, the, the tools of, of a nation state then, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can declare, hey, this is our border. And since y'all don't know how to act and you don't know how to control things on your side, no, nah, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to have to build, we're going to have to build that wall. Right. <laughs> we're building that wall. Not Illinois wall. can declare it, right? <laughs> um, but... <laughs> But all jokes aside, it does provide it provides, uh, I think, uh, more of a legal cover and a, and a resource cover for dealing with those sorts of thorny issues. Right. So for most issues like taking that political politicized tension out, right, by separating these groups would actually help more people come to come to realize like, oh, yeah, this is this is an issue. Let's do some common sense solutions. Yeah, I mean, I I think so, and that in combination with the ability to you know utilize you know trade and tariffs and right. other sorts of inducements, right? Um, I think that the combination was like, okay, well, listen, we're gonna, everyone in our in our state or in our region can still have unfettered access to guns, but we're going to make sure that those don't leave. You know, anyone who's found taking those outside of our state. Uh, you know, you're going to face very serious penalties for doing that, right? right. Because because you're now you're creating an international incident if you do that. Right. right, right, right. And is this is the idea of national separation? Is it like something that's really on the table? 
But I mean, here's the thing, right? I was I, I did a talk. I uh, actually talked about this a couple times here locally, and it's not. It's I say it's not. Um, I think the idea that the U.S. is is facing the possibility of a major civil conflict, if not a second civil war, is certainly out there. Um, and, uh, you know, especially as we, you know, as we see the sorts of behaviors, including attempts to kidnap governors and, and, and um, you know, when you, when you see this, some of these other folks who uh, get captured and they say, well, what were you trying to do? I mean, like people like the Buffalo, the person who killed these people in Buffalo, right? Mm-hmm. You know, what were you trying to do? You know, they're trying to incite a race war. I mean, there are, there are folks who are doing real things to try and trigger what they perceive to be this coming horror show, right? Right. Um, and so I think that I think that yeah, to a certain extent, it's it's not that it's on the table politically because because it isn't right. Um, this is really a way to to get us thinking about what might need to be possible, um, what we what we should think about. Because I ask the question all the time, why why do we think that a fifty state configuration is normal or natural? Mm-hmm. The country started with thirteen states. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you were born, you know, before 1958, then you were born into the United States that had 48 states. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, why do you think that that's, why does that have to be the the configuration that we all got to stay together? Not to mention, you're talking about um, even, this is what a lot of folks don't realize is that even back in the 13 colonies, then now the 13 states, even in that period, in the run up to the constitution, there was all of this conversation about, hey, maybe we should break into three different countries. Mm. Even then they thought that, hmm. right? So that conversation has been around for a long time because I think that um, that even many centuries ago, or those centuries ago, folks realized that there's an essential incompatibility between some of the ways that these states are choosing to or wanting to pursue their, their statehood. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a, you know, human slavery and, and Indian genocide are not really palatable to decent people, even, even in the 1700s, right? Um, that doesn't mean that lots of those same people didn't step in and be like, well, they did now, so, or it's done now, so I'll, you know, take up a homestead or whatever, um, because no one, no one escapes being implicated in, in American crimes against humanity, no one, and certainly right. not people who are in the North either, right? But, right. Um, but the the point that I'm making is that even then there was an understanding. Um, this is why Governor Morris said what he said, right? It was an understanding that we're not really compatible. I don't think we are. Um, and I think that now that we have 330 million people, 50 states spanning almost every sort of geographic um, landscape that you can imagine, it just does not make sort of a priori, doesn't make sense, right? You wouldn't expect all of those people to be able to get along, right? Right. Um, right? Especially under a system that really was not actually created, no matter how many times you amend it. Mm-hmm. Um, the system was not created for, it wasn't even created for you as a white woman to, to really have full citizenship. And right. it certainly was not created for me. Nope. Um, and, and definitely was not created for black women or anyone else. Nope. So there we are. And um, I saw a question pop up. Yes, a question from Ralph. Um, how do you disentangle the centuries of history from this model of separate regions? Mm-hmm. Patriotism for the USA has become religion. How do you franchise that among regions? I, mean, I think this is a, thank you for the question, Ralph. I think this is an extraordinarily important question um, because so much of what, of what really binds, has, has attempted, I should say, to bind the US together to date has really been about symbols. Um, I think that this is one of the reasons why people get so bent out of shape when when someone disrespects the flag or or something along those lines, um, or when you even suggest that the Star Spangled Banner, you know, you know, of course that should be our national anthem. Well, that's just the only national anthem you know. But these symbols, uh, they mean they mean so much to us. I mean, I do believe that they have they have taken on a sort of religious tenor. I think this is why it's difficult. It's not difficult to change the constitution because of the need for three quarters of the states to chime in and all. That's I don't actually think that that's why it's hard. Mm-hmm. I think it's hard because the constitution is treated as a semi or quasi religious document. And that the framers, um, the founders and the framers are treated as almost sort of demigods and godlike, right? I mean, the number of conversations I've gotten into with people 
when I mentioned that Thomas Jefferson, I'm like, Thomas Jefferson's a rat bastard. I can't stand him. I mean, people like people come at me, right? Like, well, you don't know, you don't know anything about Thomas Jefferson. I'm from Central Virginia, man. And like I grew up with his descendants. Right. Like, right. You don't know me. You don't know them, right? I mean, why are you out here shilling for Thomas Jefferson? He would not have shilled for you. <laughs> I just tell you that. Right. But but I think that I think that this question is important because one of the things that will will be critical in that 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 post breakup phase is those nations, uh, those the new nations, right? Now, whether it's you know one sort of continuing United States and multiple other entities or one other or whatever, they will have to re they will have to recreate um, their own sort of symbols and what it means to to bind them together as a nation. Um, and I think that this is what this is what makes makes our political imagination around breakup so poor, because all of us think, well, I don't I, I don't want to give up the, the flag. I don't want to give up, you know, the the Star Spangled Banner. They should give it up. Right. Um, but, you know, I always ask the question, why? Why are we so attached to these symbols? Are we not more attached than to or should we not be more attached? to where we could go as people and to addressing the, the extraordinary challenges that we face today. Um, you know, if, if you ask me and you say, well, Ron, you can either, you know, keep the flag and keep the Star Spangled Banner, or you could, you know, get rid of those things so that we could actually address climate change so that our great grandchildren and, and future humans and other creatures can live. I mean, that's a no brainer for me. Mm -hmm. right um not for, not for some people yeah i know i know and that's what i mean i mean for some people this is like no i'd rather i'd rather go us all go down in flames mm -hmm. and this is one of the this is in encountering those opinions over and over again that's what has led me to where i am right it's like listen let's even now no don't get me wrong i'm not actively advocating i'm not a seditionist right i'm not actually i'm not actively advocating that we you know we destroy the united states today in fact, what I'm arguing is that we what we really need to do is think about is there a way that we can that we can live our lives as people in which we can sort of face the challenges and at the same time figure out how to how to soft separate keeping the things that are important about being an American to us so that we don't have to constantly butt heads butt heads while the world burns around us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you might end up with, you know, the United States of America and the, you know, American Federation. Y'all can use the same money. You can use the same flags. I mean, you can use many of the same symbols. Um, but those things, and I'll be blunt, they mean less to me than the survival of 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 our people and and our species. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, have you talked to your students about this idea, or do you talk in your classes? I'm just so, curious what it's this going to age me, but what the young people think. <laughs> this idea. You want to know what the youngins think? I got you. Um, well, um, no, uh, the, the, is the, the, I don't really bring this up too much to them. There are, there are a handful who I talk to about it um, because I do understand that, that especially for some folks, this is actually quite upsetting, right? Mm -hmm. um, the idea of having to think about uh, because again, this is this is born out of what I consider to be a very serious threat, right? Mm -hmm. um, I I I don't know if if separation is the is the key, but something's going to have to give, um, because we don't have the mechanisms to at least I don't see that we have the mechanisms to otherwise disentangle ourselves to use the word that was up here. Um, so I you know I don't I don't know what we're going to do otherwise, and you know again I don't want young people to not be hopeful. Um, and but the handful that I have floated this to, um, you know, they seem to think, OK, well, you know, maybe maybe that's a possibility. But they often bring up the same questions that are tied to things like, well, wh what what's going to happen if, um, you know, who gets the flag? You know, the right. same stuff. That's where some of these ideas come from. Mm -hmm. um, I see DB says, with so much unused land, are you suggesting that each state take a census on who wants to? Um, I mean, I don't know if it has to if it has to do with unused land um, for, in my mind. Um, but I think that I think that you do you do bring up an important point, right? I mean, states like Wyoming and that you know these gigantic places that are very sparsely populated, 
um, you know, it, it, once you go, once you start walking down the road of what might be different, how things might be different, then all sorts of configurations pop into your head, right? I mean, you can imagine, um, um, you know, a situation where where any number of states decide to, you know, for environmental reasons, we're going to all move to this place, stay here, we're going to build our cities here, and then we're going to turn everything else into surrounding like farmland or into solar farms. There's so many things that become possible when you have a group of people who are committed to the same purpose. So I hadn't thought about in terms of unused land. Um, yeah, occupy that space and start over again with state and government assistance. Maybe. I mean, that's a, this, is, this is one of the reasons why having that conference would be key. Because I think that out of that conference, you could, you know, the, the idea would be you have a conference where people can show up and we can have, they can have an open conversation about separation and breakup that doesn't immediately lead to, you're treasonous, you're a traitor, right? It's like, no, we're here to seriously have this conversation and think about, well, would it be better if, since we all believe, for example, that we should ban abortion over here, and y'all think that that thing, which we think is a moral moral sort of, you know, abomination, right? And I, and I got to tell you, I don't know why you would want to continue to be in relationship with people who you believe are abominable. I mean, that's just me, right? I don't, I don't get it. But if you really believe those things, then that'll, then it might make sense to have those conversations about how will we separate and what would that look like? But what would that look like in detail? That would be up to, that would be up to those states and to the political entrepreneurs who are in that space trying to figure it out. Um, that would be my, my long-winded answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you see Ralph's question. Can you expand on the role of the internet as you see it in shaping a resolution? Um, I mean, I can, but I also see the internet as being part of the problem. Um, part of what I think has, you know, what I would argue is that the, the internet provides the, the real possibility for the first time in human history to move us toward much closer to direct democracy than we've ever been before, right? Um, where you can actually say one person, one vote and have that be meaningful, right? Um, but it also has quite evidently moved us to a direction of misinformation that is absolutely deadly to a functioning democracy. Um, and so I see that, you know, the internet is, 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 I don't know, what do you, what would you might call it? It's like the, you know, the devil's workshop, right? You might be able to produce something that's like, hey, you know, here's how we can have a plebiscite that the whole country can take part in. Mm -hmm. And just equally, you know, someone might hack it and and say, oh, you know, they're going to run this plebiscite so they can grind us all into meat and feed it to kids in Somalia or something. I mean, who knows what I, I don't even know. I'm just making stuff up off the top of my head. Right. Because that seems like to be what's happening on the Internet <laughs> today. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would be fine, except that that people are believing it. You know, I think about QAnon and and the impact that 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 system, what is you know sort of a, a system of belief, in fact, right, has had on our government. And I can't, I almost can't believe it. I can't believe that I'm even mentioning it in a sort of real conversation. Um, but so the internet. So that's what I would say, Ralph. The I think the the internet could help, and more broadly from the internet is these sorts of technologies, right? The cloud-based technology, and, the, and, and this is what um, could sort of enable governance. Now, now let's be on the positive side, and let's say, okay, the breakup happens. Then, to me, we're in the the presence of this sort of telecommun telecommunications technology makes it so much easier for us to sort of organize and govern in the aftermath of that, right? Um, because, you know, everyone will have cell phones and, and, and you can still carry on conversations and you can organize that way again. Um, but there might be some, there may end up having to be for the sake of our democratic process, some very serious restrictions on the internet. Um, and that's, that's all I'm going to say, because I know a lot of people are going to be like, oh, you're against free speech. Eh, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, I don't believe in an unrestricted sense of free speech. I mean, I think when I was a kid, you know, I didn't have the free speech to say, hey, mom, expletive deleted. My mom would have, you know, there ain't no free speech in my house. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there is everyone, you have the right to say a lot of things, but there are a lot of things that you don't say because the, the repercussions of saying them, here's the, and this is how, you know, jokes aside, the repercussions of saying those things are great. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's the important thing to keep in mind. Just because you can say a thing doesn't mean that you should, right? 
Um, and so, yeah, I think that we may have to think about some ways in which, or ways in which we can sort of separate out our, our political discourse from the noise of the internet. Yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question a bit. Um, any, anything else? Um, yeah, we have time for one more question, probably. If no one else has one, I have one. I was just, I was just thinking, um, do you think that this gives room, like if there is this regional separation, right, that not all of these regions would choose democracy, that there right. might be, I don't know, some autocratic rule going on in some of those, some of those areas? Yeah. I mean, you're just asking me flatly. I, and, yeah. I will, and I will say, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, when, when January 6th happened, um, here's the thing that I always come back to. What did, what did they want to accomplish? Okay, so they wanted to overturn, overturn the election results and install Trump. Okay, cool. For how many years? Right? And I say all that to say, there's a clear autocratic bent in some of these folks already. So I would absolutely expect any number, let's say, you know, that 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 this breakup happened and it happened along the lines of of um, like we look at that that bright line, uh, bright line watch map and we see the South. I absolutely expect that to become uh, some sort of authoritarian regime. Mm -hmm. I do not expect it. There may be the there may be democratic trappings. Right. right. But I absolutely expect it to be an authoritarian regime. I mean, I think on the, so on the flip side, I can imagine a f authoritarian regime, even in, in areas that were, you know, so-called much more liberal. I don't like to use that term um, because the way that Americans think about being liberal is like globally, we're center, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But at any rate, American liberal, right? Even those areas that are more liberal, I can see uh, an authoritarian-esque, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, regime taking hold in those places as well. Um, but one that was like, hey, listen here, we're going to do what we need to do to move to address these very serious issues. And, you know, we don't have time for the misinformation of the internet because again, the internet will be hard to regulate, mm -hmm. so especially in those initial stages. So uh, the uh, an authoritarian bent might end up being the bent all the way around. Um, here's what's interesting. Like I have a student who I've been working with a student uh, who since the last semester has been really delving into uh, Roman writers um, who was saying these were so sort of writers from like, maybe six, 700 years ago, right? Um, and actually even further back, um, some of them uh, almost a thousand years ago, we were looking at the, the, at the fall of the Roman Republic, right? Mm -hmm. And some of what they observed, um, and this includes even, uh, even going back to um, folks like Aristotle, right? What they observed is that governance goes through a cycle anyway, right? Um, and it may be that, and that, that cycle typically is some sort of monarchy slash authoritarianism, some sort of oligarchy, which is a sort of loosening. Um, I'm doing it because I conceive of it like a clock, right? Mm. Uh, some sort of greater loosening that leads to some form of like republic democracy, then a loosening that, that leads to some sort of like mass democracy, right? Which of course, most people are afraid of in the ancient past, right? Which is where you start to get mob rule. And then swings back to authoritarianism because someone's got to take care of the mob rule, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it may be that um, those, as those writers sort of observed that that's, they see that as that's what happened with the Roman empire and the Republic, right? That's what they see happen. And it may be given, especially how self-consciously the United States has been uh, and the framers um, sort of modeled uh, how they would create the United States on Rome and Roman principles. It may be that that's just part of the cycle that yeah. we're at the authoritarian, we're back at the authoritarian part of the cycle, right? Yeah. Um, and that does not necessarily have to mean that democracy is permanently suspended or anything like anything like that. But it may, you know, it may result in um, democracy looking a little different until things get under control, so. Right. Well, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, do you really thank me? <laughs> I do. I you got to go home and think about it, right? This is, yeah, this is a fascinating exploration of this idea that I think is out there and it's important to talk about. And I love hearing you talk about it. And thank you so much. Um, so let's hear it for Professor Ron Watson. Thank you much. Thank, thank you, you for much. being here. Um, remotely 
And I just want to remind people that our next program will be in person only um, Thursday, March 9th at 6 p.m. with Carla Cantor, who will be talking about hypochondria. So as part of Women's History Month. But thank you so much, Ron. It was wonderful to have you. Always a pleasure. And thank you all for listening to me go on yes. and on about something kind of sad and scary. Um, but do think about it, right? Um, we all yes. need to be thinking about it in these very, very interesting times. Did you see DB asked, will there be a part two? I, I said, sure, but that's up to, that's up to you all, right? I say so, sure. No, say sure. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Ron. Yep. Take care. Right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.